Okay. Um, so I'll start off by uh, letting you know who I am. Um, generally, this is a, a, a different audience for me, uh, but I'm hoping that there's some things that we can share here. Uh, so I work for uh, Tor Project. I work in a team that is currently formed of two people on monitoring the health of the, the Tor network and performing privacy-preserving measurement of it. Uh, before Tor, I worked on active internet measurement uh, in an academic environment, but I've been uh, volunteering with Tor Project since 2015. Uh, if you want to contact me afterwards, this is my email address. If you want to follow me on the Fediverse, that's my uh, web finger ID. Uh, so what is Tor? Um, I guess most people have heard of Tor. Maybe they don't know so much about it. Um, Tor is quite a few things. Um, it's a community of people. We have a paid staff of approximately 47. The number keeps going up, but 47 last time I looked. Uh, we also have hundreds of volunteer developers who contribute code. And we also have relay operators that help to run the Tor network, academics, um, and lots of people involved uh, organizing the, the community locally. Um, we're registered in the U.S. as a nonprofit organization, and the the two main things that really come out of Tor Project are open source software that runs uh, the Tor network, and the network itself, which is open for anyone to use. Uh, currently, there are an estimated average two million users per day. Um, this is estimated, and I'll I'll get to why we don't have exact numbers. Uh, most people, when they're using Tor, will use Tor Browser. Uh, this is a bundle of uh, Firefox and a Tor client uh, set up in such a way that it's, it's easy for users to, to use safely. When you are using Tor Browser, your traffic is uh, proxied through three relays. Um, so with a VPN, there is only one server in the middle. Uh, and that server can see either side knows who you are and where you are going, so they can spy on you just as your ISP could before. Uh, the first step in setting up a, a Tor connection is that the client needs to know where all of those relays are, so it downloads a list uh, of relays from the uh, directory server, and we're going to call that directory server Dave. Um, and our user Alice talks to Dave to get a list of the relays that are available. In the second step, forms a circuit through the relays, and then connects finally to the, the web server that Alice wants to talk to, in this case, Bob. If Alice later decides they want to talk to Jane, they'll form a different path through these relays. And we know a lot about these relays. Um, because the relays need to be public knowledge for people to be able to use them, uh, we can count them quite well. Uh, so over time, we can see how many relays there are that are announcing themselves. Um, and we also have uh, bridges, which are a separate topic, but these are uh, special purpose relays. Because we have to connect to the relays, we know their IP addresses. Um, and we know if they have IPv4 or IPv6 addresses. So as we want to get better IPv6 support in the Tor network, we can track this and see how our network is evolving. And because we have the IP addresses, we can combine those IP addresses with GeoIP databases. And then that can tell us what country those relays are in with some degree of accuracy. Um, and recently, we, we've written up a, a blog post about uh, monitoring the diversity of the Tor network. Because the Tor network is not very useful if all of the relays are in the same data center. We also perform active measurement of these relays. Um, so we really analyze these relays because this is where we put a lot of the trust in the Tor network. It's distributed between multiple relays, but if all of the relays are malicious, the Tor network is not very useful. So we make sure um, that we're, we're monitoring this diversity. And the relays come in different sizes. So we want to know, are the big relays spread out? Is it just a lot of little relays that appear to be inflating the numbers of individual relays? So when we look at these two graphs, um, we can see that the number of relays in Russia 
Uh, okay, it's uh, just over 250 at the moment. Uh, but when we look at the top five by the actual bandwidth they're contributing to the network, they drop off. And Sweden takes their place, uh, contributing uh, around 4% of the capacity. So the, the Tor metrics team, uh, as I mentioned, we're two people. And uh, we care about measuring and analyzing things in the Tor network. Uh, there are three or four um, repetitive contributors. Uh, and then occasionally people will come along with patches or perform a one-off analysis of our data. Um, we use this data for lots of, di lots of different use cases, um, one of which is detecting censorship. So if websites are blocked uh, in a country, people may turn to Tor in order to access those websites. In other cases, Tor itself might be censored, and then we see a drop in Tor users. And then we also see, as I, I mentioned the bridges earlier, special purpose relays that can be used to circumvent censorship, we would see a rise in those users. So we can interpret the, the data in that way. We can detect attacks against the network. Um, if we suddenly see a huge rise in the number of relays, then we can suspect that, OK, maybe there is something malicious going on here, and we can uh, deal with that. Uh, we can evaluate effects on how performance changes when we make changes to the software. So we've recently made changes uh, to an internal scheduler. Um, and the idea there is to reduce congestion of relays. And from our metrics, we can say that we, we have a good idea that this is working. Um, and probably the, one of the more important aspects is being able to take this data and make the case for a more private and secure internet, um, not just from a position of, of, I think we should do this, I think it's the right thing, but here is the data, here are facts that we can argue with that can't, can't easily be disputed. Uh, we only handle public, non-sensitive data. Um, Every analysis uh, that we do, we have reviews uh, before we publish them. Uh, so as you might imagine, um, the, the goals of a privacy and anonymity network doesn't lend itself to easy data gathering and extensive monitoring of the, the network. Um, the Research Safety Board, if you're interested in doing research on Tor or um, attempting to collect data through Tor, can offer advice on how to do that safely. Um, often this is used by academics that want to study Tor, but also the metrics team has used it on occasion where we want to get second opinions on uh, uh, deploying new measurements. And what we try and do is follow three key principles. So data minimalization, source aggregation, and transparency. The first one of these is uh, uh, quite simple. And I think uh, with GDPR, probably is something people need to think about more, even if you don't have uh, an anonymity network. Um, having large amounts of data that you're not, you don't have an active use for is a liability and is something to be avoided. Um, given a, a data set and given a, an infinite amount of time, that data set's going to get leaked. Um, the probability is just increasing as you go along. So we want to make sure that we're collecting as little detail as possible in order to answer the questions that we have. When we collect data, we want to aggregate it as soon as, as, soon as we can um, to make sure that sensitive data is existing for as little time as possible. Uh, so this means usually in the Tor relays themselves before they even report information back to uh, Tor metrics, they will be aggregating data, and then we will aggregate the aggregates. Um, so this can also include adding some noise, uh, binning the values. Um, all of these things can help to protect the, the individual. And then being as transparent as possible about our processes so that our users are not surprised when they find out that we're doing something Relay operators are not surprised, and academics have a chance to say, whoa, that's, that's not good. Maybe you should think about this. Uh, so the example uh, that I'm going to talk about is counting unique users. So users of the Tor network would not expect that we are 
storing their IP address or, or anything like this. They've come to Tor because they, they want the anonymity properties. Um, so the easy way, the, the traditional web analytics, keep a list of all of the IP addresses, count up the uniques, and then you have an idea of the unique users. And then you could do this with uh, combining with a GeoIP database. You can get uh, unique uh, users per country and these things. We can't do this. So we measure indirectly. Um, and in 2010, we produced a technical report on a number of different ways we could do this. And it comes back to Alice talking to Dave. So because every client needs to have a complete view of the entire Tor network, we know that each client will fetch the directory approximately 10 times a day. So by measuring how many directory fetches there are, we can get an idea of the number of concurrent users of the Tor network. So relays don't store IP addresses at all. They count the number of directory requests. And then those directory requests are reported to a central location. We don't know how long an average session is. So we can't say, OK, we had this many unique users. But we can say that concurrently, we had this many users on average. We get to see trends, but we don't get the exact number. So here's uh, what our graph looks like. At the moment, we have the, the average 2 million concurrent Tor users. Uh, this peak here, uh, I think, was an attempted attack, and possibly this one as well. Um, often, things happen, and we don't have full context for them. Uh, but we can see when things are going wrong, and then we can also see when the things are back to normal afterwards. So this is in a class of problems called the count distinct problem. Um, and these are our methods from 2010. Uh, but since then, there's been other work in this space. So one example is hyperloglog. Um, I'm not going to explain this in detail, but I'm going to give a, like a high-level overview um, so imagine you have a bit field, and you initialize all of these bits to zero. You take an IP address, you take a hash of the IP address, and you look for the position of the leftmost one. So how many zeros were there at the start of that string? You then say, say there's three, you would set the third bit in your bit field. At the end, you have a, a series of ones and zeros and you can get from this to an estimate of the, the total number that there are. Because every time you set a bit, there's 50% chance that that bit would be set given a number um, of distinct items that you've seen. So there's, there's a very complicated proof in the paper um, that I don't have time to go through here. But this is one example of it actually turns out to be fairly accurate estimate uh, for counting unique things. This was designed for very large data sets where um, you don't have enough RAM to keep everything in memory. It turns out that we, we have a similar variant on this problem in that even keeping two IP addresses around in memory for us would be a very large data set. So we use this to avoid storing even small data sets. Uh, private set union cardinality is another example. Um, in this one, you can look at uh, distributed databases and find uh, unique counts within those. Unfortunately, this currently requires far too much RAM to actually do the computation for us to use this. Um, but over time, these methods are evolving, and they should become feasible uh, hopefully soon. Um, and then moving on from just count distinct, uh, the aggregation of counters we have counters such as how much bandwidth has been used in the Tor network. And we want to aggregate these, but we don't want to uh, release the individual relay counts. Um, so we are looking at using a method called PrivCount uh, that allows us to get the aggregate's total bandwidth used while keeping the individual relay bandwidth count secret. And then there are similar schemes to this, uh, Rapport and uh, Proclo from Google and uh, Prio that uh, Mozilla have written a blog post about that are similar technologies. All of the links here are in the slides, which are also on the, the page on the FOSDEM schedule, so don't worry about writing these down. Um, 
And then finally, I am working on putting together some guidelines uh, for per performing safe measurement on the internet. Uh, this is targeted primarily at uh, academics, but also if, it, if people wanted to apply this to analytics platforms or monitoring of anything that has users and you want to respect those users' uh, privacy, then there could be some techniques in here that are applicable. Uh, okay, so that's uh, all I have. If there are any questions. Question. Uh, hey, I have a question about how many users uh, have to be honest so that the network uh, stays uh, secure and private or relays. Or okay, okay. So at the moment, um, when we're collecting statistics, we can see. So, so we, as I showed the the active measurement, we know how much bandwidth a, a relay can cope with. And then we do some load balancing. So we have an idea of what fraction of traffic should go to each relay. And if one relay is expecting a certain level of traffic and it has wildly different statistics to another relay, then we can say, OK, this one is cheating. Um, there's not really any incentive to do this other than to mess up our data. And it's, it's something we can detect quite easily. But we are also working on more robust metrics going forwards to avoid this being a, a point uh, where it could be attacked. Hi, thanks for the presentation. So um, a few days ago, I heard that like, basically with your time matrix, you know that you have between 2 million and 8 million users. Ah. And you don't really know in between like, what the real number. So can you tell a bit more about the variance or which method is more accurate? OK, so the 8 million number comes from uh, the PrivCount paper. And they did a small study where they looked at unique IP addresses. So it's possible that our, so they looked at unique IP addresses over a day. We look at concurrent users. So they're, they're two different measurements. What we can say is that we know for certain there are between uh, 2 million and 25 million unique users per day. We're not sure where in there we fall. And 8 million is a reasonable-ish number. But also, they measured IP addresses. And some countries use a lot of NATs. So it could be more than 8 million. It's, yeah, it's tricky. But we see the trends. Any other questions? There's one down here. Um. Your presentation uh, actually implies that you are able to collect more private data than you are doing. So, uh, like, it says that uh, you, the only thing preventing uh, from private user data to be collected is, your, is the team goodwill and good intentions. So, have I get it wrong or? No, okay. So there are. Uh, so the question exactly is uh, that: uh, Are there any possibilities for the Tor project team to collect some private user data? Uh, Tor project does not run the relays, so we write the code. But there are individual relay operators that run the relays, and if we were to release code that suddenly started collecting lots of private data, people would realize, and they wouldn't run that code. So there, there's a step between the development and it being deployed. Um, I, I think that uh, it's, it's possible that other people could write that code and then run those relays. But if they started to run enough relays that it looked suspicious, then people would ask questions. So it's, there's a distributed trust model with the relays. And we, yeah. I'll also mention at 3 o'clock, there's a relay operators meetup if you're interested in running a Tor relay. Um, I don't remember the exact room, but it's on the Tor project blog. Any other questions? One, one more? Yeah. OK, last question. Okay. So, so you talk about pri uh, like, uh, privacy-preserving uh, monitoring. 
but also a couple of years ago, we learned that like uh, the NSA with the XK Store uh, program was able to, to monitor relays and learn exactly which user was, uh, was connecting to, to, uh, to relays, to Tor relays. So is there also like research on how to make sure that like as a Tor user, I, ca I cannot be targeted as using a Tor relay and never being able to be monitored? Yes, there is. There's lots of research in this area. Um, one of them is through obfuscation techniques uh, where you can make your traffic look like something else. So there's, there's a lot of, they're called pluggable transports um, and they, they can make your traffic look like all sorts of things. So, yep. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, so I will, I'll be outside here if anyone wants to come and ask any more questions. And I guess we'll be...